Добрый день. This is Yuri from Breckenridge, Colorado. You're listening to the Fly Fishing Consultant podcast with Rob Snow White, produced by producer Jason. Спасибо. What is podcast mean? From the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant podcast with your host, Rob Snow White. Thank you for downloading my fly fishing podcast. Recently, I was flipping through the new The Fly Shop catalog and came across a pic of a dude with a big two-handed rod standing chest deep in water throwing a massive skagit head. His name's Justin Miller and he leads travel trips around the world for The Fly Shop. So I had to get him on the show to tell us about fly fishing in Russia. So we're going to hear that in a minute. But first, this episode is brought to you by the Negrini case. Are you headed to Kamchatka or Kola Peninsula with Justin? It may be a short road trip to the in-laws for the weekend. You're going to need to protect your gear. The new Sea Run fly fishing cases are the next evolution of fly fishing travel cases. A proper hard shielded checkable luggage that gets you to your destination with peace of mind. TSA compliant and airline approved for travel. Models run from luxury to premium with the option of a protective duffel bag like cover. The patented double wall system consists of tough inner and outer shells welded together to yield maximum impact strength and resistance to all weather conditions. The results are an ultra light, ultra strong, practical fly fishing case able to handle the worst handling and deliver the best performance. You first notice the smell of the luggage when you open the packaging. The high quality leather reminds me of the aroma passing by the Georgetown leather store at Tyson's mall as a kid. And once you open up the case, you'll find compartments for tools, gadgets, knickknacks, and snacks. You can store rods up to nine feet long with the current models. And there are modular foam hockey pucks that pop out where you can snugly fit your reel. Sea run cases provide the best protection for gear in the field, truck, or the check baggage of a plane. Visit SeaRunCases.com for more information. All right, so we have Justin Miller. Justin, where are you exactly right now? So I work for the fly shop in Northern California. We're uh, 43 years we've been in business. One of the biggest fly shops in the country. Lots of you guys probably get our catalog and everything. Oh, yeah. Um, And we do... Retail and and then local guide service in Northern California. And then we do international travel business as well. Some of our bosses and stuff. The owner of the fly shop is one of the pioneers in traveling a bunch of places all over the world. And so I'm Mike? back in that department these days. And that's been a little rough in 2020, but we're getting back online. Yeah. All right. So for those who who haven't seen you before, met you, who do you look like that we might recognize and and picture while we're listening? <laughs> I don't know, man. Just uh, who do I look like? I don't know. I got a big red beard, man. Okay. Like a Viking. We'll go with that. Yeah, there you go. All right. So how did you start working at, at the fly shop? Where, where did your, your fishing career and, and love of fish come from? Yeah, so, um, so I grew up in California, in the Bay Area, in Oakland, and then... Uh, you know, I worked at a summer camp in the Sierras. That's where I learned how to fish. And then when I was in, in college in Chico State, that's when I started fishing crazy style every single day after school. Um, got into steelhead fishing and, and was all about it. And then, uh, you know, and I was studying steelhead in, in, in college and everything. And then when I graduated, I found a job working for the fly shops fish camp, a summer camp for kids. And they hired me for that position that, that summer after I graduated. And I didn't have any place else to go at the end of the summer. And they asked if I wanted to stick around. So I moved to Reading and started in with them. Fantastic. So why were you studying steelhead? What was it about them? And were you studying them before you caught them with the fly rod? Kind of like the same time. 
you know, I started getting into chasing them. Um, and then so I was a environmental geography major at Chico State. And then so, you know, I was thinking about them every day, chasing them with the rod. So then when I got to the books in the library, that's also what I wanted to read about and follow um, in the major that I had. Uh, let me let me do that. Let me follow follow them, read more about them. Also, lots of salmon too. I was reading a lot about you know Chinook and other, other salmonids in the in in California and stuff. That's kind of what we were reading and writing about. So your class time, you get to do your lab outside with the fly rod. Pretty much, man. That was it. What was it like was when it. landed your first steelhead? Um. It would have been my first year at, at Chico, so that would have been uh, like 2001 or something. Okay. And do you consider Great Lakes steelhead to be real steelhead? Do you even think <laughs> about them? Oh, man. I don't want to make everybody upset, but, but, uh, but, man, you know how it is. If you're on the West Coast, no, you don't think that. You know, the, the thing is that I always tell guys, because because I don't want to be, you know, put down or anything like that, because I know some of those fish are amazing, you know, but the, just the definition of steelhead is is that they go to an ocean and back. And I know the Great Lakes are big, but there's no salt, there's no sharks, there's no sea lions and the like. So, you know, I don't understand why guys don't claim to have the, the greatest lake run rainbow system in the in the world or lake run Chinook or you know, anything else, land, landlocked something, but, but, uh, you know. Does the fly shop do any travel to the Great Lakes? We do not. We do not. And not out of, uh, you know, honestly, I mean, so we don't do too much. We're just starting actually due to the pandemic and stuff, doing more destination travel in the lower 48 states. So it's not that we're, we're anti Great Lakes by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that we've never done travel in the lower 48. We don't do Florida either, you know, and we, we've never done Montana for that matter. And, you know, that's one of the most famous places in the world for fly fishing. Um, it's just not in our, our area. So we've always been pretty much international travel, including Alaska and then our local Northern California stuff. But, like I said, we're just starting to, to branch out into the lower 48 and starting to book, uh, you know, those Rocky Mountain trout destinations, Florida tarpon, Louisiana redfish, you know, Olympic Peninsula steelhead and, and, and some of those other destinations we have in our own country in the lower 48 that are, that are pretty exceptional that we've been looking past. How about bluegill in Washington, D.C.? That sounds awesome, man. I don't know. I don't know if I can sell it, but uh, but we I got snakehead, walleye, bass. I mean, whatever you want, it's in the river here. That's awesome. It's, that's it's awesome. pretty crazy. I'd be fishing it if that's where I was. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, what's it like working with a fly designer like Mike Mercer? You get to pick his brain. Oh yeah, man. So, so yeah, man. He, I mean, he, Mercer's an absolute legend. Absolutely. So, I learned a, a bunch from him. You know, when I was when I was a lot younger, I, I learned so much from him and tying trout flies and nymphing. I mean, that guy's one of the greatest trout fishermen of all time. Now we we make fun of each other a lot. I tend to swing flies with spay rods, big steelhead deal, you know, and he's still the god of nymphing. And, and uh, so we poke, poke a lot of fun at that, just like the, the Great Lakes West Coast things. It's the same thing with the, with the spay nymph thing, right? You get, get the poke a little fun, but, you know, not too serious right but on. yeah he's, he's a legend he's a legend with a single hander on a dead drift man yeah I, I need to get him on here at some point it's been it's been a long time absolutely absolutely so how you said the so mike started the the mike the owner started the travel business when did that start going and, and how did he decide to throw travel into his fly shop to international destinations yeah, I mean, I mean that was long before my time. He likes to rub that in that, that he's been doing this since before I was born. So I don't know if it was, I mean, you know, that, you know, this is uh late seventies, and those guys are just they're just they're just fish bums, and the world was you know open. Travel was starting to get easier, but there weren't those those big lodges. You know, they they were just Alaska was there. And they were learning from that and then expanding it into new new places, right? So they were they were just starting to to do the chili in Argentina. That be the, you know, they they put that stuff on the map for international trout fishing. 
and cause, and that's what we were doing in NorCal, and then it just kind of expanded from there, right? Then then uh, you know, once they were established, you know, they were on the the lead edge of the saltwater game in the Bahamas on uh, Belize and in and, and all that stuff, and then uh, and then yeah, you know, it just snowballed. Then they were in place, knew how to do it, all the marketing. So when you know when Kimchaka came around in the in the uh, early '90s, they were they were first into that game, and in um, so yeah, it just you know snowballed it just, but started like like we all were right, just, just just some fish bums that wanted to go fishing. They just they just took it further. Yeah, man. And then when did when did you sort of move into the travel? And did they they didn't just send you out with the group? You probably had to go on a couple trips first. Yeah. So you were saying uh, your first time traveling with the company. Yeah, so so I got I got really lucky, you know. Um, I had some really good mentors that kind of kind of you know groomed my path into it, um, especially in Kimchaka. But it, but essentially, I've done it all with with shop. So I told you I started with the the summer camp with kids, and so then at the end of that summer, they they brought me just into the retail floor. So then I was just hustling rods and reels and flies out of here and just fishing like crazy. Then then I fell in love with the spay rod and I started swinging. And, and in Northern California, the vast majority of our guides uh, and anglers fish fish nymphs, you know, dead drift nymphing. And so I, I wanted to do swing only and I wanted to start guiding swing only on some of our local steelhead rivers, the Trinity and Klamath mostly. And so I started doing that. And then, and then uh, through that, I started, you know, I started chasing steelhead further and further away. So I started getting up to British Columbia, met a couple of lodge guys there, got some of my clients to start going up there, fishing BC. And it was just a strange time in the travel department where we didn't have uh, too many steelhead experts. And so, so they kind of asked me to get back there and help promote the steelhead fishing. And they kind of, kind of went out from there. And then also I'd that's how I got back in the travel department. But the first, when I got into Axel, the, the traveling, this is some years before that, even some of my mentors were guiding over in Kim Chak and kind of groomed me for that and had me ready to when they stepped down, they were just like, hey, Miller takes one place. So I stopped guiding locally as much and started, go, started going over there for three, four months at a time over to Russia. So you single? Yeah. No dog? No dog, man. <laughs> you just take off when you want. That's it. That's exactly it, man. That's it's a, it's a tough game to, to bounce. I don't have any plants either. They don't make it. It's pretty funny. So how, you've been doing this for a while, how has travel changed with modern technology, be it photography, GPS, fishing gadgets, You've been using it oh, man. for a while. Those have definitely changed. How have you seen the industry and just gearing things change around travel fishing? Um, I mean, some of the stuff just, some of the stuff, you know, moves at light speed. Some of it is the same old thing. That's one of my favorite things is, is the rods and the reels and the lines and the flies that don't change. The stuff that worked a hundred years ago is still the stuff we're doing. It might be a little bit lighter and made of graphite instead of bamboo, but yeah, our tech doesn't change that much in the actual fishing, but but you're right. Some of that periphery stuff. I mean, the mostly technology, right? Like, I remember the when we we made this movie in Kamchatka, Eastern Rises. I think that was in 2008 or something. Yeah, it was 2008, my first year in Kamchatka, and and those guys hauled a stinking boom across the ocean you know in in these airplanes you know through moscow this giant like 12 foot expandable stick so that they could hang cameras off it and get aerial views you know and now these guys that every single film is all drone done and you know guys are flying their flying their little you know two ounce cameras around on on drones and i mean it's just a game changer and that's that's in under 12 years same thing we used to have those crazy like almost suitcase style satellite phones that were super grainy you know to, to communicate these guys you know now now guys will show up with housings they clip onto their iphone to make it satellite compatible so wow. some of that stuff's just pr pretty crazy we're not traveling over there having 
an iPod. The beginning, you probably had a Walkman or a Discman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we might have had an actual uh, iPod for sure. Those little micro deals, you know, that was right when M MP3s were coming out. But yeah, now, now everybody just has their whole library on their phone, man. It's, you know, that that's another big one, too. Just watching clients' cameras or guides' cameras go from, you know, everybody, you know, the digital SLR was 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 awesome. And, you know, and it still is to some degree because of the lenses and everything, but geez, so many people have bailed on their little underwater point and shoots and everything just and just pull out their pull out their iPhones on the river for their for their pitch. Instant gratification, show it off at night, airdrop it to all your buddies, you know. Don't have to be like, take my camera, take my camera, and be like, God, ah, don't worry, I got it. Take it on their camera, get back to camp, airdrop it, boom, done. Yeah, it's so, fifty. Yeah, the the, the technology stuff, you know, it's Helps it helps us guides from having to compile them all and doing thumb drive, you know, send outs at the end of the season for every week of the year. It's actually kind of nice. When you have clients call up and book, is there a vetting process to make sure that that these are people that can handle the travel getting there and the conditions once you get there? No, I mean you guys got to know that that you know they got to take that responsibility from for themselves, but. But I, but I always like, you know, going through all the details with people. And, and I think that's really the, the big benefit of calling guys like me, travel departments, you know, is, is us being able to say, hey, what exactly are you looking for? Are you a numbers guy? Are you a big fish guy? And then, yeah, you know, explaining that, hey, I've fished this place before. This is big, fast water, big rocks. Um, and get, if guys are like, oh man, I got some bad knees, and then, then I can just say, hey, this isn't the spot, you know. Let's go someplace, you know, that, that we can handle a little bit better. So, so to some degree, I mean, I'll always ask what a guy's looking for, and then be, be able to explain like what physical requirements there are. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go tell a guy, nope, you, you didn't qualify for this program, right? He's going to cut his own his own throat if he can't hack it, and he gets there. Well, ultimately, man. That's how he's going to learn next time he's going to go on a boat trip instead of a waiting trip, you know? How many trips do you do in a year before there's global pandemics? Um, you know, it's, it's always different. We're always trying to just stay ahead of the thing. So um, there's some that, that, you know, I take a group to every year. Like uh, I do an annual thing in Mexico, but lots of it's just kind of spur of the moment. Just, hey, we want to, we've you know, we want to see this destination. This new thing is coming out. We want to be you know, on the, on the ground floor getting in there, or, or we just need to know it so that we can market it. Um, so, so sometimes, you know, we, we'll probably plan three a year and then, and then, and then there might be a couple more spur of the moment missions to go, go see some stuff, you know? Do you follow the seasons at all? Like if you want to be, you know, fishing the fall run, you'll do the Northern hemisphere and then you spend, you know the next oh yeah straight through the south. Mean, yeah exactly for us i mean so you know our, our travel portfolio is 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 worldwide so absolutely i mean the, the whole shop kind of revolves on 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 the yearly calendar but but the strange thing is it's kind of can be flip-flop too so you know in the summertime we have all of our people in in the northern hemisphere fishing we have kamchaka alaska the coal peninsula everybody's fishing and some of those we have to be you know Kimchaka we're, we're really in communication with those lodges taking care of our guides making sure they have everything they need but really in the summer when all your clients are in camps you're actually selling the opposite right you so Mercer will be selling chili um chili trout trips when we're running summer stuff in in, in the north and and vice versa so you know, right now in the winter, you guys should be in Chile. They're not because of COVID. But, you know, guys would be in Chile, but I'd be answering phone calls for guys planning their summers in Alaska and Russia. But, yeah, we're always following the fishing calendar. And then other stuff doesn't matter as much. Tropical saltwater stuff, you know, those guys book year-round, so, and can fish year-round. I'm going to go on a limb and say there's probably not fully stocked shops where you're traveling. So you provide them a packing list. Are there things that each guide specifically wants or each travel host that you, you think people need for specific location? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, when you book with us, we, we do everything you need. So we call it a pre-trip and it'll have a packing list, you know, for everything from, you know, how many pairs of long johns to pack, but then, yeah, it'll have a whole, you know, list of tackle rods, reels, line, line weights, um, you know, your, your leaders tip, it's definitely a fly selection. The fly shop does custom selections for every destination we send people on just so that they got the bullets. And, you know, some places are all inclusive and have that stuff. And if they can, that's awesome because they're going to have exactly what they want. But, but yeah, and there's, there's no fly shops in Kamchatka. So you got to bring all your own stuff. If you forget something, you're not going to be able to go down to a corner shop and get it. So yeah, we want guys to, to leave our shop fully prepared. Got everything they got. Do the, the guides and lodges stock up on anything just in case that they know they can make a couple bucks on? No, I don't think there'd be any, you know, um, I don't know if there'd be any benefit, right? I mean, like, like I said, if, you know, the, our lodges in Chile, those guys can can pre-order preseason bulk. And then, yeah, they're probably going to charge you a tax, you know, $8 flies that they paid four bucks for, but they also had to pay for shipping to get it down there. I don't think it's too much of a moneymaker as it is just a lifesaver for guys. You know, in, in Russia, the super remote places, those guys have weight restrictions. So same thing. There's no way that a guide in Kamchatka can bring enough flies to, you know, to keep his hundred guys he's going to guide the season with with fresh bugs. He, you know, he, he, he'd have to bring four hundred pounds worth of stuff. And that's not going to happen. So, so yeah, no, I don't think you know it's a luxury if your lodge has flies there, and they're going to be more expensive than if you bought them at home. And, but at the same time, the guides down there that are charging double aren't necessarily making a killing on it. Right. There's a spot near us. So we've got snakeheads. And the conventional guys use topwater hollow body frogs. And there's this hole in the wall convenience store for cold beer near one of these famous fishing spots. And they will sell those things for $15 plus. Just because nice. if you're there and you lose one, that's the only place you can get it. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, no, that's, that's that's just that's just a good business sense right there. But he, that, that guy, you know, he's just taking care of taking care of uh, you know, t- taking care of his own idea there. That, that's that's good thinking. Yeah. All right. So let's talk Russia. Let's go with Western Russia first. We do Kola Peninsula. Since we we've done some Kamchatka talk, there's been nobody who's talked about the Kola Peninsula. So yeah. if you could tell us like how far it takes, like what's the travel like, the species, you know, what's camp life like, a typical day of fishing. And I'll just ask questions as you tell us all about Cole and why we should book a trip with you. Yeah, you betcha. So so a couple things. I mean, really the the cola is is easier to get to than Kimchaka and, and far nicer combinations and everything. You know, Kamchatka is, is, we are way out remote. It's, it's, it's so far out there for, for North Americans. We, we take a, we got a week, you know, once a week plan and everything. Coal is just North of, uh, of, of, of Europe, essentially, right, right North of, of Norway getting there really easy for Europeans. It's like they're British Columbia, you know, for, for in, any any West Coast steelheader, we just pop up north and, and go fish the Skeena system. That that's exactly the the cola is that to the UK guys. Um, you know, any any European Atlantic salmon fishermen, that's what they want to do in the summer is just just pop up north to the cola and go fishing. For us Yanks on the other side of the pond, you know, it's it's still super easy. So we just you fly to Helsinki and take a charter up, or you can fly to Moscow and take a take a little puddle jumper from Moscow up to Murmansk. So the travel actually is super easy. Everything hugs out of the town of Murmansk, so you can just you fly in there, and then just like on the other side in Kamchatka, you jump jump on the iconic Russian Mi-8 helicopter. They're just beasts. You can get twelve guys, all the guides, all luggage, um, out to the camp in one trip. And then the cola is crazy, man. The, I mean, for as remote as they are, um, you know, these are hour, hour and a half plus helicopter flights, no roads, accessibility at all, full wilderness area. And these guys' lodges are just amazing, like full on 
ultra comfort, you know, single occupancy rooms in, in suite showers, flush toilets, just fancy. So it, it's, it's quite an experience for sure. What's the day of fishing like there? Tell us what happens when you open your eye in the morning. So, so this all, pretty much all those coal rivers, especially. Okay. So the, the peninsula kind of has a North coast, um, the point, and then um, the rivers on the South and they're, they're totally different, all totally unique. The rivers on the South are Grills rivers. Um, the, um, the Varzuga is, is, is one of the, the top names down there. And these guys, guys can catch 40, 50, 60 fish in a day. But, you know, the biggest one's eight pounds. So they're just volume gross rivers. When you get to the tip, the tip of the peninsula, kind of on the point, that's probably one of the most famous iconic names in all of Atlantic salmon fishing. That's the Panoy River. The Panoy is rounding around that corner. So they still have high fish counts for numbers, but they can start getting some bigger fish. But still like 20 pounds is a bigger fish on the Panoy. And then you round come around the corner and you get on that north coast of the cola and that is my favorite stuff and those are high gradient nasty rivers that big fish had to adapt to be really big and strong to, to navigate the, these rivers um probably some of the craziest wading in the world but some of the biggest brightest atlantic salmon that that uh that you can that you can target with healthy populations so all these these rivers are above the Arctic Circle, so so it is a rough environment. On top of on top of that, you know the gradient of the rivers is just stark. There's no big trees, maybe some twisted little birches down in the in the river, but but the top, you know the the top of the plateau is just like wind blown, you know, granite and tundra just just it's it's crazy brutal and so again i mean built building these epic lodges out in in those types of environments is is just it's it's a feat you know it's it's just an amazing thing to see and be part of when you're there but yeah yeah the, the, those north coast rivers they're they're crazy they're uh harsh what are they going to feed you at the lodge oh man the, the, yeah they go all out Little russian mm -hmm. salads well, I mean, usually, usually, yeah, there's usually a good soup and everything, but but it's it's not as as full Russian as Kimchaka. Kimchaka is straight Russian meat and potatoes. You eat the same stuff they do uh, at their house when you go home after after seasoning camp. You go back to eat eat your guide buddy's wife's cooking, and it's exactly what you were eating in camp, which is awesome. I love it. You know who doesn't like meat and potatoes, but but the cola, you know, it's, they go fancy, man. They got, you know, the ASR, they got flaming duck night. They got all you can eat king crab piles that they just caught off the mouth of the river. Like, yeah, that next level food for sure. Are you guys too tired at the end of the night to have some vodkas by the fire? No, man. So that time of year in the summer, at that latitude above the Arctic Circle, there is no fire because there's no sun sunset. So it's 24 hour sun. And so we go, you know, some some guys, me included, you know, we're like, hey, I'm on the cola and I ain't here for a long time. So you just go mental. So usually they all the all the best camps have a fantastic home pool where the lodge is built. And so you get helicopter brings you back to the lodge in the evening. You go take a shower, chill out, maybe vodka, go get some amazing dinner, and then go throw your waders back on and go fish again till midnight. That Just sounds, fish till you die. That sounds ideal. It's it's epic. I mean, the sun never goes down. Some some of the camps make mandatory rest on the pool because it's an assigned beat for somebody the next day. But some of them, man, I mean, I've been out there um fishing the home pill till two o'clock in the morning and you got to remind yourself dude you have to go to bed or you're gonna ruin tomorrow you know it's something else you can literally fish till you kill yourself on, on when the sun doesn't go down and you're looking for that one big monster grab is there a crowd that gathers by that home pool no, if, if, your people if, are? if uh you know if it's early season and you got a week with a bunch of gung-ho dudes you know, you might have to do Rochambeau or something. See so who goes first, and then you go, go laps.
um, some of the places like uh, Yokenga has like five or six different kind of beats in that little home pool beat. And so literally you get, you get drawn and you know, you're going to be river left of, of the main pool on Wednesday night. That's yours. And so on the, on when you get a drawn beat for the evening after dinner, you know, you pick which days you're going to go to sleep early. If you're like, ah, that beats that, that beats a little fast this week. It hasn't been kicking out a bunch of fish. Sweet. I'm going to go get an early night's rest. But if you got, if you got, if you got the, the honey draw, Dang it, I can't remember. I'm, I'm spacing on the name of the home pool. But, yeah, if you draw right or left on, on that one beat, you know you're staying up late. But they also kick you off, I think, at, at midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning. They rest it for the next day. But you know you're going to fish it until they literally blow a whistle and tell you to get out because the time's up. That's got to be the last stressful couple of minutes counting down to that whistle yeah 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 you're like one more cast one more cast and you see the guy looking at his watch like come on baby one big grab what's the uh, the rod and reel setup what are you going to be packing for that trip you know it depends on the season so you know up at that latitude we start fishing basically in, in early june start fishing that's that's like full runoff so that whole area is under a sheet of ice all winter you know and so finally by June, that's, it's all breaking up. And so, you know, the first week or two are a big gamble. You could show up and the, and there's still giant chunks of ice coming down the river and it's super cold and you can be hosed, but you can also, you know, show up and it broke last week and you're sitting on a river. So it's always going to be high and cold, but the fish could be pouring in and those are the, those early fish are going to be the biggest, brightest, strongest fish of the whole year. So guys are gambling on those first couple of weeks that they're going to get the highest quality fish ever. Those first high weeks that are high and cold, you're going to be using big rods. Guys use nines and 10 weight rods. And then depending, you know, West Coast steelheader that I am, I throw a skadget and then, and then sink tips off of that um, and bigger, bigger tube flies. And then, but lots of the Euro guys, they got their own, you know, 3D guideline heads and stuff like that. But the idea is the same. We're going to be fishing deeper in that big, big, cold, fast water. As the season progresses, that water is going to get lower, clearer, warmer, and the fish are going to get kind of like steelhead. You know, the longer they're in the river, they're going to get a little bit more color. Um, and, the, you know, those lines will get shallower and shallower so they don't splash and you know scare fish as much and the flies are going to get smaller and smaller and more delicate until you know the end of july guys can be waking you know super tiny little tube flies or you know some guys even dead drift fold traditional dry flies over those over those fish is the fly choice more about your confidence in it than actually just getting a, a strike for some shape or form of the fly uh i think that's a big part of it but but there is some science based on conditions right so schnell does my favorite fly in the world in the middle of june if you tied it on in the middle of july the guides would laugh you out of the river and every single fish would would blow out to the next pool the second it hit the water you know so you just can't fish a four inch you know, aggressive, heavy fly in the middle of July because it's 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 too scary. It lands too hard, heavy, all that stuff. But but yeah, if you got, you know, in the swing game, confidence is everything. You know, absolutely. But again, it's it's the it's the uh, it's the conditions that kind of dictate where your confidence is gonna be. You know, same thing with winter steelhead. You know, I'm not gonna fish a four inch intruder in July on the North Umpqua, but I'm going to fish it in February on the North Umpqua maybe. And, you know, then it's the difference between where's my confidence, pink or blue today, right? And then, then I don't think pink or blue actually matters, except in the angler's head, if he's believing in one or the other. And the same, 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 same goes in Atlantic salmon world, for sure. Is there any time to go and sightsee, or is it just 100% fishing? Like, there's no village out there to go visit. To bring home um, souvenirs or somebody's looking. 
Well, there's, there's, yeah. I mean, Murmansk is a small kind of outpost town. There's a little bit you could poke around for a few days in Murmansk if you're, if you're, you know, if you're looking for side adventures on the way. The really the thing to do is is go see something else in Russia. You know, like like uh, go spend four days in Moscow. Go see Red Square. Go see the Kremlin. You know, go see Lenin's tomb. You know, go see all the Rembrandts in the museums there, and then take the puddle jumper to Murmansk and go fishing for the next week. But yeah, I probably wouldn't do a four day Murmansk sit and 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 uh and look for any touristy stuff. But but the rest of Russia is so cool, and it's all on that European side. So actually, one of my favorite trips ever. We planned around. We we planned this thing. I, I planned it for four years, but last in in 2018, the World Cup was in Russia. And, you know, those guys were playing in June. And I was like, oh, this is, this is too easy. So, so I, I set up a, a hosted trip for the Okanga. And we spent a week in St. Petersburg, what, caught a um, World Cup soccer game, saw Messi's first goal, Very Argentina cool. versus Nigeria. You know, spent a week hanging out, hanging out in, in St. Petersburg, seeing all that, watching football. And then, uh, and then popped over you know, to do, do a week on, on the Okenga. It's like a three hour flight out of St. Petersburg to Murmansk. So, so those kind of combos, there's tons of side stuff to do, but it'd be a, a flight involved. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, there's someone that might go on our fishing trips here that likes to hit up tender in uh, so exotic locations. What say it again? Sorry. So it's there's that. a guy that'll fish with us and, and, and he may go on tender sometimes when we're in these <laughs> locations and, and try and meet a, some, some companionship while we're in town. Uh, do you ever have to book an extra seat back because uh, a Russian mail order bride has joined the, the crew <laughs> picked up? I have not seen that, you know, I, I bet, I bet that old thing would might work in Moscow or St. Pete's, but I, I bet it'd be slim pickings in, in Murmansk or, or uh, Petropavlovsk. So I, I haven't seen too many, too many guys get, get, get stuck with that deal. And have you picked up Russian? Can you con- you know converse? Just know the bad words like me? Yeah, no, man. I, I definitely started with the bad words, but I've been guiding over there for uh, since since 2008. So, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time on the ground now. So, but yeah, you know, my first couple of years definitely it was the it was the uh, the bad words first, but but now I, I can get by pretty well. You know, I mean, I can. Uh, you know, I, I can pretty much talk about fishing, camp, rivers, weather, direction, food, like an order, um, all that stuff that would happen in camp. I tell people I know bush rushing, you know, and I can get through restaurants and stuff like that in, in town. Yeah, we're definitely not talking about, you know, geopolitics in Russian, that's for sure. Yes, there are no geopolitics in Russian. It's just Russian politics. Yeah, that's it. It's Th- this way or no way. Yeah, so you've been going there for a long time. Do you have a good relationship? Do you look forward to seeing the same employees year after year? Oh, yeah, man. Dude, some of those guys are my brothers, for sure. Do you ever have to bring them stuff from America? Oh, every time. They'll get pissed if I don't bring them some of that stuff. What do you bring it so, back? Yep, yeah, so American tobacco, mandatory. For some reason, Marlboro Reds taste better when they're bought in America than when they're bought in Russia. I don't believe it because their smokes are a buck a pack and ours are 10 bucks a pack, but apparently they say it's worth it. And then the chew, they can't get chew at all. And so the Americans showed them that poison. And, and so they're always begging for that. And then, uh, the mouth boys love go with all the stuff. nicotine. Huh? Did you ever bring them gum or nick or a uh, mouthwash if they're chewing and smoking the whole time? No, 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 no. They're not, they're not concerned with that. No way. The other, the other big thing is Levi's. So a pair of Levi's no. is like 350 bucks. So the boys will send me their sizes and be like, you know, bring, bring me this size Levi's, you know, and be like, ah, cool. Get there, back like 80 bucks or whatever you paid for it. Right. And then it just it blows their mind. They're like, I'm going to be such a badass at the bar. When we get out of camp rolling Levi's, people think I'm rich. So I mean, it's always always funny some of the stuff they like but yeah they love those love those levi's and american tobacco i guess crazy before the iron curtain fell that was still a huge thing 40 yeah years ago. iconic man yeah 
Anything else about the cola that I didn't ask you before we jump over to Kamchatka? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's just there's so much, but but yeah, I I, I think we covered it pretty well. Let's do the same thing with Kamchatka. The same question. So cool. That's got to be an easier flight just across the Pacific. Um, you kind of so. You know, people have gotten accustomed to it, and people love it, and it kind of makes it gives it that yeah, the allure of easy accessible. Um, but in reality, I mean, so so they we get a flight that runs seven flights a year, once once a week for seven weeks. Um, in the core of our season, basically, all it does is we fill that plane with fishermen. There's a few other people, maybe volcanologists, some hikers, but. But not nah, men, mostly fishermen. And, you know, so you still got to get up to Alaska overnight in Alaska. And then that flight, um, it, it pops on over, in my opinion. And I'm I'm good at flying, but the Moscow route isn't all that bad. It's only two flights out of L.A. So we fly L.A. to Moscow, Moscow to P.K. Um, and you can choose to overnight in, in that or not. I usually do for comfort. But, but yeah, I mean. It's a weird thing. We talk about it every day at the shop. People, you know, if we take that airplane away, people will be like, I'm not going. It's too far. And really, it's it's not that bad at all to go through Moscow. But, yeah, the flight makes it easy for sure, at least in people's minds. There was a big gap in when people could travel to Kamchatka. Correct? Um, yeah, the, well, there's been a couple of years where, where it's fallen the, we lost the flight in 2019, and then we lost the flight in 2006 and seven. But we still operate. Like I said, we, we still go through Moscow. If that airplane dies, there's still a thousand ways to get there. Just not the ultra convenient one, right? Yeah. So how far into the bush are you going there? So the Kamchatka Peninsula is roughly the, the size of California. And they basically have one town. So it'd be like flying into San Francisco on your commercial flight and then hanging out in just that town. And from there, anywhere we go, we got to go by helicopter, MI-8 helicopter. And so our, in our trout programs, we have three areas that we operate out of. So we got uh, the Northern Rivers. That's where the Sedonka and the Wilderness Floats are. Those are the furthest in helicopter time. And that's like about three hours one way and they got to stop in a town called so and refuel and then and then poke back out to the river um that that's probably the, that's the longest one and our kim check the steelhead project in the fall that's what i still run um that that's similarly way out there near those near those rivers to the north northwest so i think most of us picture kamchatka from the eastern rises movie which is just huge trout rising up to mice on pretty much any cast you want yeah yeah my god that that's real that's real so so that that movie is uh you know it's that movie is filmed on on three or four of our different programs and so so lots of times people just you know they they meld it together and think that it's one one big experience but but really you you kind of got to pick your area you gotta be like okay i'm gonna go do this and there's there's some places the Sedanka, for example, is just high population density river. It's a spring creek. There's there's a billion fish there, and those fish average like eighteen to twenty two inches maybe is like the average, and and like they top out around twenty five inches. But those fish are all on mice. And then if you hit a hatch like we did in that in that movie, then you get then you can get those sippers, those, those fish rising on traditional dry flies. And you can just go pick your way down and just slay on, on, on traditional flies. But you get guys that are like, yeah, I catch plenty of fish at home on dries. I'm here to mouse and guys will just rip mice right through, you know, the hundred rising noses and they'll you know, just whack them on the mouse the whole time. Right. And that's the whole thing with trout, right? The old opportunistic feeder. So they might be gorging on mayfly on a mayfly hatch. If a mice comes by, they're still gonna eat it no matter what. Wow. Yeah. Did you ever get tired? You ever get tired of hooking top water trout on mice? No, nah, man, you really don't. You just don't. It's just it is something else every single time. 
every time watching those things just chase behind it short strike grab it jump out you know you never know how a fish is going to take it i got a couple theories but but yeah i mean they'll attack from behind they'll, they'll attack super soft um almost like they're sipping a mayfly then they'll just do the murder you know the, my favorites are the ones that jump out of the water and land on it on the way back down those ones are unforgettable what's the mouse pattern of choice first or lemmings no 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 so um we found out you know a while ago basically with the the the, the number one fly hands down that we use now is, is hickman's mr hanky the thing is the thing is awesome it, it you know it casts well it fishes well but most importantly it's the least lethal and so <clears throat> we pretty much had to outlaw a couple flies mercer's lemming being one of them and then Kenny Morris's Moorish Mouse was one of the favorites of all time. But those, those flies had solid shank, long shank hooks that rode down. And so the foam would be over them. And those fish, if they hit it hard, they'd catch it in the bottom, bottom gill rakers. And it was like a 50% mortality rate. They were just, we were killing half the fish we, we caught. And it just, it was no bueno. So, so uh, uh, Mr. Henke came out. And it has a, an extended trailer hook that's upriding. And so it's way back with the tail, rides up. And, and we tend to hook fish on the, on the hard pallet in the, in the top of the mouth, um, in the whips, way more, um, far less mortality. And so basically, we switched everybody over. We are like, we banned solid shank down riding hooks over there. And we're like, this is the only fly that we're doing. But, uh, but it was awesome. So Morris you know, we, we told them that and he's like, what the hell? We're, we're not selling the fly anymore. And, and so we, we told him the scoop and he went out and, he, and he's now come out with the Morris Mouse 2.0. Then fish is awesome. And all he did is take his, his same Morris Mouse pattern and making an, an, an upriding trailer hook, catches just as many fish, kills a tenth of them, you know? So, so yeah, it's, it's basically about, it's basically all about the design and, and, and preventing unnecessary fish mortality. That's, that's how I choose a mouse fly, to be honest. When you're doing the trout fishing, are there any other bycatch things that might come up and eat a mouse? Oh yeah. 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 So the mouse actually is kind of a selective deal. So you're, you're actually, you, if you fish a streamer over there, you can like get pissed. There's too many fish, you know? So if you just put on a black leech or something that looks fishy, you just, you're going to catch every fish in the river. And then the big bycatch that's really cool and unique is there's a char species over there called a kunja. That's the local word. The, I guess our, our word, we call it a Siberian white spotted char. So same family as a Dolly Varden, but, but this thing is a pretty ferocious predator fish. Um, they, they, they're about the same size as the trout, you know, top out at 25 inches on the Sedanka and stuff. Um, and they're resident on that river and, and they'll eat the mouse a little bit, but if you put on a streamer, you're going to catch more, more, um, Kunja than rainbows. You're going to keep your rainbow numbers up, but I mean, you'll be taking off 150 fish a day. So most guys they'll, they'll put on the mouse because they can still catch 30, 40 rainbows in a day. And, you know, cut down a little bit on, on some of the other stuff that won't stay off the line of the streamer. And then the other really interesting one in Kimchaka is uh, they have a sixth Pacific salmon that we don't have on our side of the pond. So, so they have all the same ones we do. They got Chinook, Coho, Chums, Pinks, and Sockeyes. Those are the five Pacific salmon that we have on our side in Alaska. And whatever um but they have another one called a cherry salmon or a masu uh, and the sadanka has those and I, i've actually caught those on mice um but but we you can sight them when they get darker um and run pink pink streamers to them and, and catch those that that's pretty that's pretty cool that's usually a pretty unique fish for guys to check off their bucket list what else are you going to see out there during a day of fishing big eagles stellar yeah, the eagles, eagles. Bears. The eagles are a big one and the bears, you know, and, 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 uh, I mean, then that, that's really it. Everybody actually is always really surprised at the lack of big 
mammal life in Kamchatka. For some reason, it just didn't evolve and, and do great there. The, no the, the bears got huge eating fish, but there's not too much else um, as far as big predators. They got some foxes. We'll see red foxes out there. Um, they got wolves to the north. I've never seen them. Um, they got some giant moose. They got some caribou, but but uh, yeah, both of those are few and far between. But you'll see deer, bears daily, and then and then that stellar sea eagle is something else. Thing is ginormous. How about the wildflowers in the summer? Um, there can be some really good ones. There can be some really good ones. Mo- mostly though, like um, lots of our fishing is just down in the tundra so lots of uh, it's just it's just you know spongy it just it's vibrantly green around springs and stuff you'll you'll see a little bit of color but but not not crazy in terms of color it's but the greenness of it is is striking if you see pictures of kimchaka in 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 uh in july early august it's just like fluorescent green it's something else wow how would your fishing setup differ if you're doing trout versus steelhead? Basically exactly the same as it would here at home. You know, we don't nymph at all over there. That's that's one of the beauties over there. Is we don't have to do the egg peg bead thing like you do often in, in AK when the salmon are spawning. So and it depends on the river. The Sedanka, we'll stick with that. We've been talking about that. That's nine foot six weight and a real aggressive fly line. So the fly line is... That was one of the biggest, actually, we were talking about it earlier, advancements in technology. When I first started guiding over there, guys were bringing over their, their six-weight rod and, a, and like a six-weight trout line, which was designed to turn over a parachute at them, and then we'd tie a mouse on it. It'd be, it'd be rough. It was like, it's like putting a bass popper on a trout taper, you know, and it was, it was a struggle. But these lines now, these ultra-aggressive integrated shooting heads like the Scientific Angler – tight and taper are mouse punching machines man they're so cool so so we you know we tie a four foot leader you know on onto the end of a on the end of a tight and taper and put a mouse on and guys can throw that thing a country mile with crazy accuracy they're that's just they're, they're they're amazing and that's not going to tire you out casting that all day way less than it would if you were on a trout line you know yeah. what i mean like that, that line does all the work for you. It's going to, it's the, the, the mouse goes for a ride on that line instead of on a, on a real trout line where you feel like you're just, we're trying to muscle up the, the mouse through the wind. It, this thing, the, the line's going, the fly has to follow it, you know? So it, it's a pretty, pretty cool thing. But that's, you know, so that's, that's single handed nine foot six weight stuff up on the north on the Sedanka. Our other river, you know, probably the most famous river in Kamchatka, arguably, after the Sedanka, is the Japonaba. And the Japonaba is a trophy river. I mean, I've, I've tape measured fish that were 35 inch rainbows, probably weighed 17, 18 pounds, and had never been to the ocean. I mean, I've caught steelhead that are half that size. They're just big, beastly rainbows that don't run to salt. They're just kick ass. And for food. those, those we got to gun up a little bit. So we'll, we'll run. Uh, eight weights for those guys. Um, same thing, tight and taper with the mouse or, or uh, you know, tight three, 15 foot tight three sink tips and streamers to, um, targeting those trophy suckers. And then for steelhead, you know, then the whole game changes and, and 99% of, of the steelheaders are going to bring a spay rod now. So, you know, and, you know, we're, we're looking for a trophy rainbow at 30 inches on the Japonova. That's going to be a guy's fish of a lifetime for his rainbow career. And, you know, that's entry-level steelhead on, on, the, on the Kimchaka Steelhead Project. They probably average 31 to 32 inches. A fish under 30 inches is rare, right? A fish over 30 inches in trout fishing is a giantly big deal. So when we're steelhead fishing, you know, we're running seven-weight spay rods, super light tips those are low gradient slow tundra type rivers you know so we don't have to be deep but 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 yeah we're gonna we're gonna gun up with with those with those bigger spay rods do you get into taming at all i've not i've not they don't have them on the kamchaka side they got them on the main mainland side of uh of russia and i've not been over to do that or or have i been to, to mongolia or any other places they lived Okay. 
Definitely well, on the bucket list for sure. When they're cooking you meat and potatoes, is it just meat or do they actually tell you what it is? No, well, so that's, that's actually a, a funny question. So I don't think I've ever seen like fresh beef in Kamchatka. So 99% of the time, you know, when we're, when we're, when we're eating meat, we're eating pork and chicken. And the, I mean, the, the pork is fantastic. I'll eat, I'll eat their, you know, so I'll do, you know, pork chops, whatever. So lots of, lots of fried meats, breaded, you know, lots of meat in soups. So they do, they do ton of, ton of meats and soups and stuff like that. So yeah, but yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to go see a, a, a steak on, on the grand finale night in Kamchatka. That's for sure. What do you eat when you're drinking vodka over there? Oh, good question, Onion, man. Cheese, pickles. Yes, well, so so the easy easy one is pickles, bread, tomatoes, cheese, and, and kielbasa, salami. You know, some sort of sausage. That that's the easy easy platter. But but the best thing in the world to do it is with red caviar. So salmon salmon eggs, red salmon eggs, like you're like you're chasing vodka with Potsky's great balls of fire, but. It's way better than it sounds. I haven't had a vodka and pickle in about ooh, six o'clock today. It's last time. My neighbor <laughs> last night. Exactly, man. That's that is that is the good stuff right there. Yeah. And he came down. There's a, a little itty bitty incline, but we had a little bit of snow last night. So I was waiting for him to come to the kitchen and I look outside and I just see this imprint in the snow where it looks like somebody fell and wiped out pretty hard. And then he said, and then he came by 20 minutes later, said he got so wet from falling. He had to go change all his clothes. No way. Yeah. Nice. And then we were supposed to get seven inches of snow. It's, I mean, there's not even a dusting. Yeah. The weather stinking weather, man. Probably, probably went golf and kept everybody else at home. Right. Speaking of weather, what you ever experienced something crazy in, in the rush of Far East or Far West that just blew your mind? I've seen um, some storms before on trips that we were talking about one last night on Martha's Vineyard where our whole tent, the ground was shaking all night from thunder and we couldn't sleep. Yeah, totally, man. So I, I was just going to say, I've had, I've had some wind out on the tundra that you thought was going to shred your tents. Not, that can get kind of scary. But yeah, yeah, you know, you, you travel enough, you see Mother Nature get some. Russia, I think that's the that's the craziest I've seen is is the wind. And then I mean I, I've seen some some rain events like 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 nothing else. But I I can't say I've seen it there. I've seen some heavy rains, but 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 I I have seen heavier in the Amazon. And actually I was just in Louisiana for redfish. And that was, I, I saw, we had a, we had a day that was probably some of the hardest rain I'd ever seen in my life. Am, Amazon rainforest desk for sure. But out, but out there in the tundra, it's the wind when you got nothing stopping it coming off an ocean, you know, no trees, no cover. And you just got a tent pitched on, on flat tundra. Whew, man, I can get gnarly. Yeah. Do the locals ever tell you to worry about like Russian Sasquatch or Baba Yaga? No, man, no. So that whole thing in East and Rises with the Iroquium, I think they were all just pulling Frank's leg. Yeah, you never hear dudes talk about it at all. I mean, I never heard about it on the, on the Cola side at all either, but I should bring it up with those boys. I spent a lot more time in Kim Chaka, and they, and they, they all, no, he's not real. He's not real. It's only story. It's only story till you get taken in the middle of night. <laughs> that's it that's it yeah yeah what are some I mean, other 99 percent of the people here would say the same thing you know yeah. what are some of your other favorite travel destinations you get to do with work and do you ever get to go scout scout out places beforehand that your company hasn't done business with um yeah we definitely do some of that um you know i mean for our business though i mean we don't often get to go to some place that doesn't have something ready to, to, to market. Right. So, so you, essentially you're going to be established by the time we're like, okay, we're going to do business with you. So that means, you know, you, 
you have you have a fishery that that you know is already good you already have a lodge you have chefs like you can provide a product that that isn't gonna you know embarrass us and piss off our guys right um so so often there there's that but you know so what I'll, I'll give you an example those the african waters guys um, I mean, I've been watching those guys for years and they just had, they have all these killer programs. They got the tiger fish in Tanzania. They got those Nile perch in Cameroon. They do the, the GT trigger thing up in the Sudan, you know, all these just killer things. Um, those giant fish off of Gabon, you know, and, and I was always like, man, these guys are awesome. And I bet we could market that stuff, but we just, we didn't have, Africa, mainland Africa. We did the Seychelles, but it just, it was always there. And then, so those guys came out and did a tour in the States and, and hit up a bunch of local clubs. We invited them to come do a presentation with us. And I was so pumped to see it, you know? And so, you know, all of our travel guys went there and saw this thing. And the guys, the guys were like, man, we'd love to work with you. We'd love to get, you know, do something. And the boss is like, yeah, no, we totally should. We've all been watching you for a long time. But it's one of those things where you're like, okay, let's book for, let's plan it for next season. Then it takes me another year to get it in the catalog and get the market in. And it could, it could be like a two year deal before, you know, we're established and selling that trip. And so these guys were like, well, actually we had some, some crazy cancellations next week. And we were writing the catalog at the time. And so I got to ask the boss, I'm like, Hey man, this is our opportunity. We could be, we could have this thing in the catalog with, boots on the ground experience by the end of the month and he's like son of a gun all right you go go do it and and it was nuts from from when i met those guys to when i was standing in tanzania chasing tiger fish was under six days but it was it was awesome and it was absolutely out of this world fishing just i, I came home like we're crazy for not having this in the catalog sooner and we've been all, all about getting getting behind that destination, and, and I'm super pumped to work a lot more with those guys and bring on some of those other crazy African jungle missions because they're that that first one I went was absolutely next level, man. T Tanzania tiger fish. That's probably probably one of my one of my new faves. I never got north enough into the Okavango to to find those fish, but I would definitely like to to wrestle with them one day. Dude, they're so cool. I would go out of my way to make that happen. Yeah. Anything about the fly shop and you I forgot to ask before I got some other just questions at the end? Um, I, I, I did don't know. The old days of the catalog when it was, you know, half an inch thick, but it was like a, a phone book. Yeah. And on newsprint, my favorite is when we dig those things up. And, I still you know, we'll be... Them. Yeah, the boss will pull pull one of those things out and just be like, oh my God, look at this one from 1982. And they're selling those like rubber boot foot, you know, boot, you know, waders and stuff. And you're just like, holy smokes, it's 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 cool. It's iconic, you know. It's, it's yeah, I've been up. watching the evolution of steelhead flies you guys have sold throughout the years. Yeah. That's totally. Yeah, I I our the new catalog we just got from you is upstairs on the next to the kitchen sofa, where I can cool. peruse it at, at leisure. That we we love that. That's why we keep doing it. You know, some guys are like, "Man, I just want to see it on my phone," but the, that that's something yeah. we take a lot of pride in. Is that guys get the catalog and don't throw it away. They they look at it throughout the year, pick it up. Our our favorite one ever is when a guy says, "Yeah, that that's what sits on the back of the toilet." Well, I was about to say, perfect, in man. college, we had every catalog imaginable in our bathrooms. That's it. That's it. That's the best. That's the best praise we get. I if, tell if my our, clients, if our catalogs on the top of the stack in the bathroom. We're stoked. I tell my clients, if you want to learn all the names of the flies, just put the catalog next to the toilet. Just that's the it, man. That's it. That's exactly right. Yeah. All right. I got some uh, some nonsensical questions. We'll round this out. Got Who's got the best sandwich in Reading? Oh man. I'm about to go there today. They, uh -huh. they, we just found this guy. Actually, he's called Lucky Millers. He's over off 273, man. I've been there like three times this month. He is next level. I don't know how I didn't know about him before. What's your order? Oh, uh, man, we've been trying everything. Guy does burgers, too. He's got this elk burger that's like three meals, man. But it is 
It's like nothing else. It's it's crazy off the hook. But if you don't want to kill yourself with a four pound burger, I, I'm way into the hot pastrami right now. And I'm just jealous. You know, California cuisine in general is just awesome. It is. It is, man. I, I've not been out to California in ten years, I think. Well, for us, the the staple at least at least three four times a week, I, I eat Mexican food, and that's always. I feel terrible for people that don't have quality Mexican food in their state. I hope you guys do. We have everything you can imagine and more where we live. There we've you got, go. We got a, a Uyghur Chinese restaurant up the street. What? Uyghur, the the uh, the group in China that's basically being murdered out of existence in slave camps. But yeah, it's what? spelled U I G H E R Uyghur. Yeah, it's like the group of Chinese people that are enslaved and all sorts of horrible things. But I'm you, looking that up. Yeah, you can get any cuisine in the world where we live. That's Our clients up the street own a Vietnamese restaurant. I, I love it. Vietnamese. That's that's been a new new one, new jam for me too. Yeah. Bon Me. No, we have good. a whole Vietnamese shopping center about 15 minutes from here where everything in the shopping center is Vietnamese. So so growing up in the bay, that that's the epicenter of food down there. You can get any, anything from any place. It's, it's not quite as diverse up here in Reading for uh for uh for for eating, but but we still got a little bit. Yeah. And then Peruvian chicken is one thing that no one else has but us. People hear about it all the time in this podcast. What's it called? Just Peruvian chicken. All right. It's marinated, charcoal roasted. You get half whole or quarter, and you get two sides. And it's it's just the best chicken. And you can't find a recipe for it. No one. Really? I just wrote it down. I was going to try to poke some. Yeah, we have one in the Korean neighborhood down the street. Dang. All right. All right, next question. Uh, what is your favorite Samuel L. Jackson movie? Pulp Fiction, gotta be. Yes. Uh, do you have any vices or bad habits that you need to break? Not having a spouse, you probably don't have to break any bad <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, that's gotta be a long list. Surely my mom would tell me I gotta stop smoking someday. Yes. Uh, any superstitions? Um... Yeah, I don't use white lighters. Yeah, that's been... Yeah. My brother always told me never use white lighters. His yeah, brother, bad, he... bad, bad mojo, but you put a jinx on the whole damn thing. Yeah. What is something that goes with you on all of your local to exotic fishing destinations? Headlamp. Brand, make, and model? Um, just for, for easy use, old Petzl Tinka. But that sucker goes through batteries, man. I, I curse it out a lot. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Black Diamond. You've got... Yeah. House has got one of yeah. those. I had a Black Diamond that was like the, like the surface of the sun. That thing was so bright. So if you are going to come out to D.C. for some bluegill and Peruvian chicken, and you Into come over, it. what's your drink? What do I have to prepare for you? Oh, geez. If, it, if it's hot, gin and tonic. You know, we can definitely if it's uh if it's cold steelhead and whiskey nice got plenty of that friends just dropped yep. off a whole bottle of hudson bourbon there you go man yeah i'm all about bourbon if you had to be isolated other than covid uh restrictions you know where in the world would you want to be stuck fishing if you had like your, your bill murray groundhog day Oof. oh so you don't have to worry about seasons yeah if you were stuck in the same place day after day it was the same Probably be on a tributary of the Skeena, chasing nice. steelhead every day. Uh, what's up with rods on shoulders? I, I hear that a lot, actually. I think some some guys are just like showing off, but but I like what uh, I like the fancy S handle clip paw only. And if you put that damn thing in the gr in the water and it gets sand in it, and locks up, and it's a pain in the ass to get apart. That best answer you can have right there. Yep, prop, prop it up on your shoulder. Just keep it out of the water so you don't have to deal with fixing it. If you were allowed to have any pet, wild, exotic, domestic, regardless of laws and regulations, what pet would you own? Oh, man, I've been looking. I got this skunk in my backyard that, that we're actually getting cool. He can just walk by now, and I don't jump up and run in the house. 
And uh, oh, I was like, man, that'd be so cool if I had a pet skunk. They're supposed to be awesome pets if you get the gland to take I've, out. I've heard they're totally awesome pets. And, and uh, yeah, it's so cool looking. You'd have the shock value. Everybody that looked at you would be like, oh, my God. But it's hilarious. Yeah, they're bitching. Probably, too, you can borrow some hair for tying, them, tying some flies every once in a while. You wouldn't mind. Yeah. Uh, final question. What's that one fish that got away that, that still haunts your memories that you want to do over? Um... Yeah, um, probably, probably, <laughs> this, actually, this is a good one. So, probably this one fish in the Thompson, but the Thompson is like, was, is the holy grail of steelhead fishing, in my opinion. And unfortunately, somehow we let it die. I remember before I ever fished it, reading this, this book, and it, it said, you know, the, the, the fish in the Thompson are so strong. He said that one in four fish in that river is unlandable. And that, that idea to me that you could hook a steelhead that no matter what you did was unlandable, he was going to kick your ass all over the place. That idea, like, sucked me into this place. Like, I just want one fish that's unlandable. That's it. And, and sure as hell, I, I, I touched him one time, and it was something else I've never felt lightning like that and that's just big water they can just they you, fish could run for a kilometer with ever without ever going around a corner and just school you seven times but yeah i remember i remember hooking them I, I remember watching them porpoise on the way down and just seeing he was giant and un, unbroken lightning gone i just remember sitting there holding that limp line just being like oh my god i just wanted to see him a little bit closer you know beautiful all right, Mr. Miller, where can listeners find you to book a trip, either in person or through the internets? Yeah, easy. The, um, the flyshop.com, man, is uh, theflyshop.com. Super easy to find. My email is even easier, justin at theflyshop.com. Give me a shout. Talk about fishing anywhere in the world, man. Yeah, man. And also, uh, you know, I was wondering, you know, you guys are the only ones that sell second rod tips. Yeah, yeah, they come they come with our our uh, our spay rods and our single handers. Yep. Yeah, I asked Rosenbauer. I was like, well, you know, if you can just mail people replacement tips, why can't someone just proactively just buy a spare tip from Morvis? He's like, we don't. We're just stuck just trying to make rods right now. So, yeah, I bet. Yeah, no. Get getting getting stuff manufactured right now is a doozy. Yes. All right, my man. Well, uh, yeah, cool. I, I'm, I'm jealous of your uh, travel and fishing and you to work in the fly shop. <laughs> right on, man. Well, Rob, it's really great to meet you, dude, and thank you so much for uh, for reaching out. That was fun. Yeah, man. Thanks, and hopefully I can get out to California soon. Dude, anytime you want to come swing a fly, brother, you know where I'm at. All right, man. Thanks again. Cheers. Can't, can't wait to listen to it. All right. Take care. Thanks, Rob. Later. Bye. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.